Thank you and welcome everybody to Lunch and Listen. I'm loving this series. For one, it gets, gives me the opportunity to meet and talk with our musicians who I really miss and don't get to see. And also it brings you closer to them and you have uh, an insight into their great artistry but also their humanity. And so it's been a really fun, fun series. Um, Sarah Schuster is our principal oboist of the orchestra. And Sarah, that was beautiful. Telemann, welcome. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm so glad to be here. And also, thank you to everybody who's listening. I really appreciate you tuning in, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. So I'm going to start. Um, the oboe borrowed this Telemann, which was written in the 18th century, from the flute. Am I correct on that? Yes, they were originally written for solo flute. Yeah. And, and so, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. <laughs> Um, I was going to say there are 12 of these fantasies in different major and minor keys. Um, and I was going to say, I really have been looking forward to exploring more of these, um, but haven't had the time because we've been so busy with orchestra. So since we've been a little bit, had a little bit lighter schedule lately, um, I've been enjoying the chance to sort of get to know these pieces. And also I find them very comforting somehow, I think because they were written so long ago um, and they seem just very timeless somehow, which is nice right now to have that certainty in times of uncertainty. Beautifully said. Um, Sarah, you've, you know, had a had an incredible career path here, including studying with, um, well, first at the Interlochen Academy, which is a prestigious uh, institution for high schoolers up there in the cold north, especially in January. <laughs> yes, but it's cold, but gorgeous in every season. And how many years were you at the Academy? Um, I only spent my senior year there, which is actually pretty common for most of the students to attend. They go for one year, usually senior year, um, but I was lucky enough to get to go to the camp as well 
um, bookending that year. So after my junior year, before my senior year, and then right before I went to college. So I'm really glad I got to spend that much time there. It's such a utopia for young artists. Um, and there's just such a, you have so much space to be completely idealistic without being mocked or sort of told, oh, you shouldn't go into music. So it's really, it was a wonderful place. I'm really glad I got to be there. I was lucky enough myself to spend a summer there. So I know of which, including those beautiful pine trees and black squirrels. They were yes, of kind course. of unique, <laughs> unique, unique place. In my day, of course, all the um, girls had to wear a corduroy blue knickers, but that's gone now. That was that is gone now, but that was still in place as early as you know the early two thousands. So I had to wear those too, and I actually won the concerto competition, and that was what I wore, knickers. <laughs> it was um, unifying. No one stood out based on what they wore, and I, I think um, I think I read once that Joe Maddie said something about, and no one looks good in a pair of knickers or something like that. That is true. <laughs> But from there, you went to the Cleveland Institute and you studied with one of the great teachers of all time, Ray Mack. He was, and still is, um, a legend in terms of teachers. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, it was wonderful to study with John Mack. I mean, he- Sorry. Like, that's okay. You're probably- I blended two teachers. <laughs> <laughs> John um, Mack. But yeah, John Mack was the principal oboist of the Cleveland Orchestra for many years, um, starting with Zell in 1965, I believe. And so his, his legacy, he was so influenced by Zell, just I think he only spent five years with him before Zell left the Cleveland Orchestra, but it carried through for the rest of his life. Um, and so he was a wonderful teacher in that he was always encouraging, but had very high standards. And he sort of would let you come to him in a way. So he would say, well, you know, when I started as a freshman, he said, well, you know, you're here and I'm here. And over the course of four years, we'll sort of gradually make that, you'll make that journey, I mean, to get to where you should be, to be graduating and to get to be sounding the way I want you to sound. Um, but he was very patient and sort of encouraging. Um, yeah, he was a great teacher. I actually had the chance to meet him when I was much younger, when I was 13. Um, he used to do a week long intensive oboe master classes up in Northern California. Um, they were called the Hidden Valley Music Seminars and they still go on today with other um, musicians. But I had the chance to meet him when I was 13. And so that really sort of decided for me, okay, yeah, I want to be a professional musician and I want to go study with him. And so um, I was lucky to make that connection early to sort of know what the level was that I needed to get to and to have that goal. Um, yeah, he was fantastic. His former students are in orchestras all over the world and especially in the US. So yeah, I was very lucky. Uh, it was a great springboard. And you got your master's degree in New York. I did. I actually, when I graduated from CIM, um, I had won an interim position as second oboe in the Dallas Symphony. Um, it was actually an interim principal audition, but they gave the second oboist the principal spot in that capacity and offered me her spot as interim second. And so I got to do that for two years between my undergrad and my master's. Um, and then when that position ended, I started a master's in New York at Manus, studying with Elaine Duvas, who is also another one of John Mack's most prominent students and a wonderful teacher in her own right. In fact, her bio starts with, Elaine Duvas is an institution in the oboe world. And she is one of the few people that can really say that <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, so I studied with her for a year um, in New York at Manus. And then all throughout that time, I was taking lots of auditions, um, trying to win an orchestra job. And I won the job here at the end of my first year of my master's there. and so. We moved to San Diego because really, if you're trying to get an orchestra job, it doesn't matter what degrees you have. It matters only how you play. And so, yeah, the rest is history. And now we've the been here for over a decade. <laughs> well, that was one of the questions from one of our audience members is, um, what was it like to win the job here? I mean, what describe that experience, that audition experience. <laughs> well, it was lovely to win this job. <laughs> uh, and I would say I'm, I'm glad that it was lucky to land in such a beautiful city with, um, you know, people who live in it who are curious about the arts and um, culture and want to support it. Um, to take an orchestra audition, basically what happens in normal times, of course, um, the union, the National Union has a magazine and they advertise every month orchestra positions. So principal oboe, principal trombone, whatever. You send your resume to that, um, that orchestra and if they're not screening resumes, that means they'll let everybody come and audition. So you're assigned a time on a day and you fly there and put yourself up at your own expense. 
you prepare a list of excerpts, which is, oh, probably at least 10, usually more, 20 plus a solo. And then there are usually three plus rounds for this audition. So the first round, the preliminary round, um, you probably play five or six excerpts. So you maybe play four or five minutes tops. And then with that info, the committee will decide whether to pass you on to the next round or to say, no, thank you. And then you just go home and start over again. And I should say all these auditions are screened. So they're anonymous um, to prevent bias or anything like that, or if anybody knows someone who's auditioning. So um, it's, it's all, all very, it's an odd experience to be performing for people live, but yet to not be able to see them um, or see their reactions sometimes. That can be good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> If you advance to the next round after the prelims, you're advanced to the semifinal round. And usually that'll be a little bit of a longer list selected from that list of excerpts. Maybe it'll be 10, 10 or 12 excerpts. Um, maybe you play for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, there can be multiple rounds of semifinals. If you make it to the finals after the semifinals, usually that's quite a long experience. Um, that can be playing for up to an hour, all the excerpts, like the whole list, a whole concerto. Um, and often in the finals, the screen will come down. So you'll be seeing the, the audience, which is the committee. Um, you'll be seeing the music director usually. They'll interact with you and ask you to do different things um, to see how flexible you can be. Um, and then at the end of that, sometimes they don't even pick a winner <laughs> or they have further trials where you're invited to play with the orchestra for a week or two. Um, so it can be quite a laborious process and this is something that you have to fund yourself, so it can be quite expensive as well. Um, and I took, to date, I think I've taken close to 20 auditions. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that you just have to get better at by doing. So do you remember, did they, did, at the end, do they read a number? Are you a number when they announce who won? It is it a name? You're a number until the screen comes down, and then you're a name. Got it. So it really just depends on how anonymous they wish to keep it. Yeah. It's a thrilling moment. Um, so uh, why does the orchestra tune to the oboe? And at what pitch <laughs> does the San Diego Symphony Orchestra tune to and why? <laughs> so the oboe, here is the old adage that the oboe is the most difficult instrument to play in tune. So much so that everyone has to tune to it. <laughs> now, luckily, our equipment has been updated quite a bit in the last hundred years or so. And also, um, reed making prowess has become much, much better. So I would say, yes, we can play in tune with other people. Not everyone has to just play with us. But I, I think that's where it came from. You know, we have these traditions in in the orchestra. For example, the concertmaster comes out and bows, and then the, then they the oboe tunes. So I think it comes from a long-standing tradition. And of course, as when you're training in school, you learn how to do that, how to give an A that's you know solid and easy to listen to and match um, and authoritative. Um, so it's an art, even though it may be a little bit outdated. <laughs> um, and the other question having to do with what pitch do we tune to? That's a great question. And I would assume perhaps that person knows that not all orchestras tune to the same pitch. Um, in the San Diego Symphony, we tune to 440 which is very common um, in the US. So orchestras in the US sort of tune to 440 to 442 range. Orchestras in Europe and other places abroad tend to tune a little higher, um, especially if you listen to like old Carrion recordings from Berlin or old Vienna Philharmonic recordings, they play very, very high comparatively. And I think that some of that is to get more brightness in the sound. Um, here in the US, we have a tradition in woodwind playing, especially, of trying to get a warm, resonant sound that's a little bit more covered. Uh, one of my teachers always liked to say a forest colored, re -colored uh, tone. Um, and to do that, it helps to play a little bit lower in pitch, um, hence the 440. Um, and we all train that way. So it's another tradition that was begun, you know, 100 years ago. And um, we all learn, we use equipment that plays at those pitches and we learn to make our reads that way. Um, so it's very, I would say it's a very unique thing for, for the US. So tell us a little bit about your instrument. How long have you been playing this particular oboe? Well, I play Leray Oboes, which is a French company. Um, many, many people in the US play those oboes, in fact, even though they're French, most of their business is in North America. 
Um, oboes wear out. So every four years or so, I have to buy myself a new oboe. Um, and the reason they wear out is because the bore is um, conical. So that means it's very tiny at the top where the top joint is and you know gets gradually larger as we go down toward the bell. The top part is so tiny that it can, any little warping that can happen over time with moisture, temperature change, just being played and vibrated for years, um, swabbing out the inside, all those things can change the bore in a way that will make it less resonant. It'll make the pitch funny. Um, it'll sound more dead. So that's why we, we update our instruments. But I play Larays and I love them still. Yeah, I don't think I would Well, change. I have to say you have a beautiful sound and um, in you. your own home, in the room and over Zoom, you still have a beautiful sound. So oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that. What, so what drew you to the oboe as a, as a student? Did somebody say you're going to play the oboe or was it something you heard or? You know, I don't exactly remember. I do remember, so I grew up in a household where we listened pretty much exclusively to classical music. Um, and my dad is an amateur musician as well. He, when I was growing up, he played piano and organ and recently he's taken up the saxophone for fun in his retirement. Um, however, I do remember sort of somewhat, he was always pointing out the double reeds to me, I think, the oboe or the English horn or the, you know, the bassoon. Um, and when it came time for band class, of course, this is in fourth grade for me, um, of course the oboe wasn't available, but we eventually sort of procured one and I got private lessons. Um, and I liked, I liked the sound. Everyone says they like the sound of the oboe and that's what drew them to it. And it is unique and pungent. Um, I also liked that it was, it was unique in that there was only one oboe in band. So I liked doing something a little different and I liked being the only one doing that. Um, and I think that's pretty true for a lot of oboists who start that way. There's usually not that many oboes in the band, except maybe if you're in Texas and they have very robust music programs there. But huh. yeah, that's how I started. <laughs> you know, we could talk for a long time about one of the characteristics of oboe players, and that is you spend a lot of time making reeds. And yeah. the question is always going to come, talk to us about your reed making. I mean, and how yeah. did you learn? And you gave a fascinating um, uh, description and to the board at the annual meeting, as I remember, and uh, I, I never tire of hearing the, the <laughs> challenges of reed making. Well, I'm glad to hear it <laughs> because here we go. Uh, let's see. Well, you know, playing the oboe is an art and a craft, and of course, the craft part is the reed making. Um, all professional oboists make their own reeds, pretty much, um, and just for those just an overview for those who may not be familiar. Um, oboe reeds come from a substance called cane, which is actually, um, it looks like bamboo, but it's like a cousin of bamboo. It's a member of the grass family. Um, and so we buy this cane. It's been, it usually grows in the south of France. Um, there's some in Argentina, China. So you buy it in bulk in about a pound or more. And at this time, it's been cut and dried for several years. So it just lies in the sun for a couple of years and then cut to the right diameter and the right um, length. And that's how we buy it. Once you buy that, you have to split off a piece that's straight. You have to cut it to a certain length. You have to use this machine called a gouger, which literally gouges out the inside of the cane. So that's the, the soft sort of pulpy part, not the bark that's on the outside. Um, and the gouger is very important because it has a, a blade on it with a very, very specific curve. Now the curve of this blade really sort of is the foundation for how your tone will be once you've you know, made the read. Um, so if you don't have a good curve on your gouge, you're already behind. <laughs> so gougers are important, ask any oboist. After we've done that, um, we tend to shape it. We have like a little template that's um, shaped like an oboe read and we sort of shape it so it's to that template and then we tie it on a piece of cork called a staple that has some metal and it's like a cork thing that you can stick into the top of the oboe. And then after we've done all that, then it's time to scrape the reed. <laughs> so this is all, all that is preliminary work. Um, and of course, for this, we want to have lots of nice sharp knives. Um, luckily, we have a lovely partner with the player um, for the second oboist. Yes, named we do. Briggs Sherman, who makes wonderful, beautiful knives from old shaving razors. So I will say I use his knives quite a bit for this, um, but you want a nice sharp knife to make sure you're scraping the cane off cleanly. And of course you have to scrape it in a very specific way 
to make sure you're getting the response and the flexibility and stability and tone quality that you're looking for. So needless to say, this is something that we start learning if we're serious about playing the oboe um, in high school or even sometimes junior high. And then it takes many, many years to get very good at it. So I would say, you know, I was making my own reads in high school, but I was sounding much better on my own reads in college and beyond. Um, yes, there's so much to explore there. It's you can really go down a rabbit hole and some people do. <laughs> How long does it take you to make a read? Uh, well, I do it in stages because I think I forgot to mention that for most of these um, these parts of the read making process, you have to soak the cane each time so it doesn't just crack. So it has to be somewhat malleable. Um, so for example, when I was talking about gouging early on in the process, I would gouge up a bunch of pieces and then let it dry. And then for the next step, when we um, shape it and tie it onto the staple, that would be another step another day. And then eventually after that step, you would scrape it again the next day and sort of get a rough outline of what you want to sound like. And then you leave it and then you scrape it again. So it's a process of, you know, four or five days, but you want to always have reads coming down the pipeline. So um, it's kind of hard to quantify that. But it takes you do it all at once. many stages. And here's the really, here's the amazing question. And how long do they last? <laughs> right, of course, everyone wants to know that. Well, right now they, they last a little longer because all the playing I'm doing right now is practicing and recording in my own home. So um, right now my reads are lasting a couple weeks, which is crazy. Wow. <laughs> However, during the normal San Diego Symphony season, um, you know, a read, a batch of reads will last maybe four days, especially if we're going really hard and playing a lot of orchestra music that's um, big. Um, that really wears out music um, reads quickly. So like I said, you always have to have more coming down the pipeline. Make sure you never it's Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, well, speaking of orchestral music, uh, reflect back a little bit on the season as it was going along so well, or, you know, last season as well. What stands out to you as a performance that you, that will always remain? You know, what was the highlight of these years? You know, for the last season, this past season, I would say my favorite program was the, we just heard it a few, maybe two weeks ago on KPBS. It was Beethoven's Third Symphony and um, Mozart's Hofner Symphony and then Mahler Rueckert Leader. I mm -hmm. believe that's what it was. That yeah. was such a fantastic program. Um, and I will say selfishly, lots of wonderful things for the principal Ovo to do. So <laughs> that was fun. And that's just such wonderful music. I, yeah, I loved that program so much. Well, and Dorothea Rochman was the singer. And for an oboist, the, the beautiful melodic line of a singer has to be inspiring. Absolutely. And yeah. vice versa. Well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, my teachers always said we want to imitate the human voice when we play in its most beautiful form. So, yeah, hearing her was just incredibly inspiring and oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, she's quite an amazing um, amazing performer. Um, I have a follow-up question to the tuning. So if the orchestra tunes to 440, what if you play something with piano? How do you tune your instrument to that? Well, usually pianos are tuned, at least at, at Symphony Hall, the pianos are tuned to 440, um, as is the tuned percussion equipment as well. So we try to really be very standardized there. Now, if we're playing, and I think that's probably the case or close to the case at um, San Diego State where I teach and perform sometimes or Point Loma Nazarene as well. Um, but you have to, you know, if you're somewhere else and the piano is wonky or a little high, um, you have to do your best if they can't tune it for you. Um, but I usually try to ask ahead of time to say, oh, can we make sure it's tuned to this and this would be comfortable. You mentioned San Diego State, and you have a number of students here in San Diego. Obviously, you're probably teaching some virtually right now. Yes. Um, how does teaching uh, influence you as a player and support you as a performer? Well, I would say teaching keeps me, holds me accountable. <laughs> um, because, you know, when I tell my students basic things like make sure you take a breath, start the note correctly, and um, things like that, player scales every day, long tones, all those fundamentals that are, you know, really the bedrock of any good 
any good technical musician. Um, if I'm telling them to do it, I have to do it myself. <laughs> I think that um, what you say about teaching is 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 affirming for any of us who you know hope to hand off to the next generation what we've learned from earlier generations and um, we are grateful our san diego symphony musicians do not just play in the orchestra they play for chamber music um, i know sarah plays a lot for many chamber ensembles here in the city um, and they teach in our in our schools and teach our children so it's a great great honor um, for our musicians i'm not sure if sarah's going to come back if she does, we'll have closing remarks. Otherwise, um, thank you for being here. Next week, we will have Kate Hatmaker uh, as our uh, guest, a violinist in our orchestra, and also an entrepreneur with her own um, acting as CEO of Art of Elan. And so that'll be a lively conversation. We have, are continuing these programs through the month of August now, and uh, I'm very excited. We have lots of volunteer musicians. This has been I think Sarah Skuster also has the distinction of being having been on every single lunch and listen program as an audience member. So we had a tremendous close to our fiscal year on June 30th. So many of you were so generous um, to uh, at this time, and uh, many of you even made an additional gift given the challenges of COVID-19. So we are appreciative of that. The orchestra is here for the long run, even though we can't hear them now. Um, and so yes, listen and no, listen here, listen here tomorrow night at 6.30, uh, Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. 6, featuring, of course, our own Raphael Payare uh, talking about that work. So we hope you'll tune in as well. And otherwise, see all of these on Symphony Stream. So back to you, Jen. Thanks so much for being here today.